السلام عليكم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد اشرف الانبياء والمرسلين وعلى اله الطيبين الطاهرين وصحابته ومن تبعهم باحسان الى يوم الدين الحمد لله الذي انزل على عبده في القران وجعله معجزه باقيه الى ان تقوم الساعه Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, before I start this, I want to just, we started late, and I don't know what that means in terms of time. Am I? All right. I'll just give a quick uh, explanation about why this happens. Muslims often uh, start things late. And in, in a way, you can't start anything late because everything is exactly where it's meant to be and given the time that it's supposed to have. But that can also become an excuse for uh, us being late constantly and not adhering to time constraints. And I'm really not one to talk about this because uh, I've been notoriously noted for not adhering to time constraints. But uh, I will say that they've actually discovered the reason why the Muslims uh, do this these people that study Muslims. Uh, and and they've, they've identified two types of time that human beings work in. One of them they call uh, monochronic time, and they pride themselves that they are monochronic people. In other words, things work in a linear type of progression, and you go from point A to point B to point C, and get to the point, and cut to the chase, and let's, you know, cut the small talk and what exactly is it that you want. There's people that function like that and they have a very hard time when they go to the Middle East because people don't like to cut to the chase until after a few days of having tea and giving you lamb and rice and getting to know you. It's part of what uh, business people in the Middle East like to do because they don't always like to do business with people. They like to find out who exactly it is they're doing business with. So you call this monochronic time and the Muslims exist on what's called polychronic time which is where you have they, they, they like to initial everything so they call it M time and P time and the P time polychronic time is the time that Muslims tend to function on and that is that experience time ticking away on a clock but rather we just kind of experience life and I have been a very strong proponent of polychronic time until recently. And I think it was just because my own nafs, the, the Mauritanians always say when things in the Sharia agree with what you like, they, they say, Hawan wa faqahu al-shara'. It's a passion that the Sharia is uh, in agreement with. It's part of your nafs that you like, like somebody um, who doesn't like onions and then finds out that the Prophet ﷺ didn't eat onions, he can then start saying, I don't eat onions, and pretend like it's sunnah, when in fact it's simply, he doesn't like onions. So, the, uh, but recently I've realized that actually Islam is, because it's a middle way, it has polychronic elements and monochronic elements also. And I think that the prayer is a beautiful example of that, in that the prayer changes over the year. It changes time, but at the same time, it's in fixed periods of time. In other words, the prayer should be prayed on time, and the best time is the, the beginning time, the first time, which this would be a monochronic uh, experience. But then the changes of times throughout the year, uh, in the winter, obviously the day is much shorter than the, uh, the summer. It's fascinating. So you have these two, and it's in the Arabic language because you actually have two plurals that are used for time. Waqt, you have wuqut and awqat. And one of them is multiple and the other is uh, what they call jam'al qalla. So having now explained why we do what we do, I'll try to go into monochronic time now and uh, get through what I want to get through. I want to thank Abdullah al-Qadi for uh, yeah, he, he gave me extra time because I tend to take a long time to get to what I'm trying to say and that's that's my own fault. Uh, first, the idea of the Qur'an as the miracle of Islam. 
uh, Islam is, is fascinating in that we have before us the miracle of the Prophet ﷺ. Unlike the miracles that we read about in the Quran that are taken based on faith, such as the miracle of Musa ﷺ when he thrust down his staff and it became a haya, a, a snake. And the miracle of Isa السلام, who brought the living to the dead or uh, dead to the living um, or the bird that he fashioned from clay and then it was given life by the power of Allah. These are miracles that people experienced at that time. And some people would contend that they have a type of what's called tawatur or uh, because there's such a vast chain of transmission of these miracles that uh, they can be accepted on that value, but we would believe in them because they're mentioned in the Qur'an. But the Qur'an itself is the, the miracle of the Prophet. This is the triumphant miracle that the Prophet ﷺ was given. One of the poets put it best when he said, أَخُوكَ عِيسَى دَعَ مَيْتًا فَقَامَ له. Your brother Isa ﷺ, he called the dead and they became, uh, they, they answered him and they stood up. وَأَنْتَ أَحْيَيْتَ أَجْيَالًا مِنَ الْعَدَمِ But you have brought generations back to life. The Prophet Sallallahu miracle is that his book is with us to this day. تَرَكْتُ فِيكُمْ أَمْرَيْنِ مَا تَمَسَكْتُمْ بِهِمَا لَمْ فَضِلُّ مِنْ بَعْدِ أَبَدًا Kitab Allah wa Sunnati I have left two things with you. As long as you adhere to them, cling to them, hold to them, you will never go astray. The book of Allah and my Sunnah. And the Sunnah is in reality an explanation of the Book of Allah. It is an explanation of the Book of Allah. The Prophet ﷺ's life is a tafsir, a commentary on the Book of Allah, so beautifully articulated by Aisha when she was asked, how was the uh, character of the, uh, the Prophet ﷺ? She said, كَانَ خُرُقُ Quran." His character was the Qur'an, وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُرَقٍ عَظِيمٍ You are on a vast character, a vast ethos. The Qur'an can be really summed up in one statement that Ibn Juzay says in his Tafsir al-Tashir. He says that it's da'wat al-khalq ila ibadat al-haq. It is the call of creation, the invitation of the creation to the worship of al-haq, the truth, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, this invitation is exactly that. It is, is an invitation. Da'wah in the Islamic tradition is an invitation. We invite people. We, do, we have never, historically have never, outside of the Arabian Peninsula, have never forced anyone to become Muslim. This is historically documented. Nowhere has a Muslim held a sword over somebody's head outside of the Arabian Peninsula and say, become a Muslim or you die. This is simply falsification of history. Other religions have been notoriously known for doing that. The Muslims have never done that. And the reason that they have never done that is because the Qur'an is an invitation, it's a da'wah. The Muslims know what da'wah means, it means literally to invite. Ad'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikmah wal mu'idhat al hasana. Call, invite to the way of your Lord in the best way, with wisdom and in the best exhortion, the best exhortation. This is the message that Islam has gone out and spread to people. So, if we look at the Qur'an as a, an invitation, it is a da'wah. We can see there is a beautiful hadith that articulates this and uh, gives a, a, a different uh, nuance to this idea. And that is, إِنَّ الْقُرْآنَ مَأْدُوبَةُ اللَّهِ فِي الْأَرْضِ The Qur'an is the ma'duba of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the creation. In this earth. Ma'duba in the Arabic language means a place. It, there's two riwaya, two transmissions. One is ma'duba and one is ma'daba. The ma'duba is a banquet in which a king sets forth and invites those worthy of the invitation to his banquet. And they must have the proper and requisite adab in order to enter into the, the, the tent of the king. And this, the Qur'an, is the banquet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in His earth. The other riwayah, which is also sound, calls it ma'daba. If you look at the word ma'daba, it is what they call ism makan in the Arabic language. It's the place where one acquires adab. And adab is that which makes us human. 
the Prophet ﷺ said the best of what a parent gives to his child or her child is adab hasan, is good adab. This is the best and highest thing that a human being can give to his child is good adab. And the Prophet ﷺ in, in a hadith that is has some weakness, some people uh, call it munkar, but it's by the consensus of the ulama, the, the meaning is sound. Adabani Rabbi wa ahsan ta'dibi. My Lord has given me adab and how excellent he made my adab. The word adab in Arabic means courtesy. And it's a deep courtesy, it's a spiritual courtesy. And this is what the Qur'an is. It is a place where we learn the requisite courtesies in order to be fully human. And those courtesies are beautifully demarcated by our scholars in the two sections of fiqh, which are al-ibadat wal-mu'amalat. The courtesies between the slave and his lord, which is called ibadat, or the acts of worship, and the courtesies between the slave and creation, which are called mu'amalat or the human transactions, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given guidance in both of these. When we look in, in, in the, uh, the idea of ibadah, ibadah has two aspects. The first is aqidah and the second is ahkam. The aqidah can be broken off again into two branches. One of the sicknesses of the age is an obsession with aqidah, which uh, in using Western terminology, which, which would go under the category of what they call kerygma or, or uh, rules of which you learn. The aqidah is not complicated, it's something that can be learned very fast. The aqidah of Imam al-Tahawi is a beautiful aqidah of which the ummah has agreed upon. It can be learned very quickly. But the aqidah must be seen as three essential aspects. Al-Qawl, what we say. We say Allah is one. We say Allah has no likeness. We say Allah has not given birth, does not give birth. These are aspects of the aqidah which we articulate. And then there is a, an i'tiqad, a belief in the heart, that aqidah must penetrate the heart. It cannot simply remain at the level of ratiocination, at the level of the intellect. It has to transcend the intellect and enter into the heart and directly impact the heart. And this is what manifests human behavior at the level that a Muslim is demanded to show. And this is where the aqidah then permeates every cell of the body and the human being's behavior shows that he is a Muslim. That he is a Muslim. Lana a'maluna wa lakum a'malukum. We have our actions and you have our actions. It is actions that, de that, that distinguish human beings and nothing else. It is the actions which distinguish human beings based on their understanding because actions emanate from understandings and not vice versa. And this is very clearly uh, understood in modern uh, social sciences. And I would uh, recommend studying the concept of cognitive dissonance, which is a beautiful, uh, a beautiful insight, which the Quran gave us centuries before. I haven't found really any insights uh, in, in my own personal studies of modern sciences, except that I've found already either explicitly articulated in the Quran and the Sunnah or implicitly understood by the scholars of Islam who came later. If you look then at what the Quran is, the Quran is, is formulated on this, this idea of aqidah. The other aspect of the Quran, which is from, from the ahkam, is how then do we get human beings? How does how does uh, the human being get from a stage where he is bereft and without guidance to a stage where not only does he understand, but he is acting according to the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is done in the Qur'an with two very important concepts and you can see the Qur'an beautifully following this uh, pattern constantly. The first is called Targhib and the second is called Targhib. In Targhib, what this means is that Allah calls us to the book of Allah and gives us the sound reasons for following the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the benefits of following the deen of Allah and what will happen with us if we follow the deen of Allah. The next aspect is called tarheeb, which is out of uh, awe, to inspire awe, rahba. The Prophet ﷺ in the hadith, beautiful dua that he made when he went to sleep, Allahumma aslamtu nafsi ilayk. وَوَجَّهْتُ وَجْهِ إِلَيْكَ وَأَلْجَأْتُ ظَهْرِ إِلَيْكَ رَغْبَةً وَرَهْبَةً إِلَيْكَ 
I have surrendered myself to you. I have placed my whole being towards you. I have placed my back uh, in your uh, security and safety. Raghbatan wa rahbatan ilayk. Out of desire for you and, and out of awe of you. And these are the dual, these are the two sandals that the human being must have in his life. He has to have the sandal of Raja and he has to have the sandal of Khawf. And so he moves forward or she moves forward in her life with the Targheeb and the Targheeb. And this is the balance. Ibn Mas'ud said that the Mu'min is the one who the Targheeb and the Targheeb Yastawi, they become equal with him. Abu Hamad al-Ghazali preferred uh, the Raja because he said the Raja engendered love and fear engendered despair. If we then look at the aspects of the Qur'an, there are seven identified by Ibn Jawzai in his Tasheer. The first one is, there are seven knowledges that the Qur'an encompasses. The first one is Ilm al rububiyyah which is the knowledge of Lordship. Who is our Lord? Who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Allah tells us and declares it in the Qur'an. Know that there is no God but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That there are no... Now, part of the miracle of the Qur'an and an essential aspect of it is the Arabic language. The Arabic language is unique uh, in terms of uh, certainly European languages, it has a unique aspect, and that is that there is no copulative verb to be. In other words, when we say in English, there is no God but Allah, we use the verb is, which in Arabic does not exist. When we say there is no God but Allah, we say la ilaha illallah. There is no God but Allah, but we do not use a copulative verb to be. What this enables us to do in language is to transcend being. In other words, there is no conceptual limitations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we speak about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Arabic language, which exists in the English language. And that is why it is impossible to say La ilaha illallah in any other language than the Arabic language. The Quran is an Arabic revelation before it is anything. It is revealed inna and zalnahu Quran and Arabian. Laallakum taqilun. The laalla here is in order that you are. It's not a hope like taraji. There's different types of laalla. Here it is. It is in order that you taqilun. That you become people of intellect. The Arabic language. Somebody asked me why should I learn Arabic? I said to increase your IQ, to increase your intellect. That the Arabic language by its nature. And all the Arabs that speak Arabic don't fall into that because they don't speak Quranic Arabic, which is that is the language that empowers and will literally give the human being a much deeper and broader understanding. Your, your actual understanding of existence increases with your increase in the knowledge of Arabic language. Why? Because it is a true language. It is a true language. In other words, the language is not simply a symbolic language in which people have agreed on certain phrases to use, like in the English language, we use the word cat in Arabic to describe cat, or self to describe self. If you look at the actual uh, evolution of the language, there it's, these are arbitrary distinctions. In the Arabic language, there is no arbitrariness there. We believe that the Arabic language is part of revelation. It is a tawqifiyah language that was revealed. It is not a language of which human beings agree upon. And this is why as you begin to move into the Arabic language and the meanings of the Arabic words, you will see conventional understandings of, of words that exist. When an Arab says nafs, he understands self. But if you begin to actually go into the language itself, it will articulate for you the reality of nafs. You will understand what nafs is. If you look at, and, I, and I'm, even though the Basris won the battle, I, I like the Kufi school of uh, the grammarians. You had the Basris and the Kufis and they used to, if they ever got together, they'd throw sandals at each other and, and uh, in the good old days, right? Now we throw bombs at each other. In those days they just used to throw sandals when they disagreed. But the, the, the Kufans believed that words, the source words were roots of the verb and the noun came after. And the Basrans believed that the noun was actually the source because Allah says that He taught Adam the Asma. Zakallah. If you look in Arabic, if we look to the verb itself, the Arabic word for nafs has, has 
uh, two, possibly more, but two words in the first form. There's six, uh, what they call bab, six forms in the in the Arabic first form, or what they call a thulathi verb. The two are nafisa yamfasu, which is on the bab kasru fathin, and the uh, nafusa yamfusu, which is dhammu The The, the nafisa yamfasu means to be miserly. The nafusa yamfusu means to be precious. Already Allah is indicating two types of self. The Prophet ﷺ said in, in a beautiful hadith about one of the munafiqeen when he was asked, who's your Sayyid? And they said, Sayyiduna so-and-so, illa nastabkhiruhu, except we consider him miserly. The Prophet said, wa hal hunaka da'un adwa min al-bukhal? Is there a disease more sick than miserliness? Because the kafir is a miser in reality because he will not give thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of... Thanks is easy to give. You know, it's like this London taxi cab driver that I got and he was complaining about all these Muslims that had come to London and I won't say from which countries, but they come during the summer and they take over a place called Edgware Road. And he was going on and on and he was told me the thing that really bothered him was they never say thank you, right? And, and I said, um, well, it does exist in their language. <laughs> Which means that it's just they're bad-mannered people, just like you have bad-mannered people in, in any culture or any language. And I, I wanted to tell them what comes around goes around. I mean, they stole everything in the, the English, right? Stole the whole world, and they never said thank you to anybody for all the stuff that they took from it, right? The colonials didn't go and tell the, the Afghanis, thank you for letting us steal your country, right? But that's another story. The, but the, uh, the idea of the bakhil, as one aspect of humanity. The other aspect is preciousness, nafis. The nafs itself, its primary nature is precious. That is why whoever kills a nafs, it's as if he killed all of humankind. This is the Quranic worldview. The nafs is precious. Now if you go into the second form, you have nafasa, which means to help other people, to, to, to alleviate somebody's suffering which is the kareem, the generous, the precious nafs will do this. But then if you move to another uh, type of transitive verb, it is nafasa, which means to literally vie and compete, yunafisuhu. And this is a sickness that comes from miserliness, not wanting other people to have generosity, to have the blessings that you have. And this is why the Prophet said, وَلَا تَنَافَسُوا And don't vie with one another. And if you must make tanafas, وَفِذَارِكَ فَلْيَتَنَافَسَ الْمُتَنَافِسُونَ If people must compete with one another, then let them compete with one another for akhirah, but not for this world. And what this very interesting that the dominant philosophy now is what they call competitive capitalism, which is literally destroying people, as the Prophet ﷺ said, it would destroy people when they tanafasuha, when they begin to vie over the dunya, fatuhlukuhum kama ahlakatum, and it destroys them like it destroyed the people before them. So this is again a disease of the self. So from this semantic feel that comes out of the Arabic language, you can see the richness of the word nafs, which in its conventional meaning simply means self. But once you begin to open it up and explore it, you get this extraordinary, uh, it's where symbol meets reality. It is, it, this is the power, the symbolic power of the Arabic language, is that it is literally meeting reality. And haqiqa in Arabic comes from haq. It comes from Allah's word is al-haq, his name is al-haq. And haqiqa is a derivative from the word al-haq. Now if you look in English, the word for reality, which is reality, comes from a word ras, which means thing. So already in the language it's indicating what they believe reality to be, which is things, material things. This is the substance of their reality, this is not the substance of our reality. We believe that the earth and everything on it is contingently real and that it will vanish like everything else. Everything is in a state of annihilation. Everything will be destroyed. This existence is not permanently real. It is only contingently real based on the qayyumiyah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He allows it to exist. This is all the worldview of the Quran that Allah is giving us. Knowing Lordship. And we must, again, the whole point of this was that you had to go into the Arabic language, La ilaha illallah. We do not think of Allah as the supreme being in a hierarchy of being. 
this is this is something that already even the Christian philosophers are recognizing the the invalidity of this point. We do not see Allah as the supreme being in a hierarchy of being. Laysa kamithri shayt. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in an extraordinary articulation by uh, Abu Bakr al-Baqallani, one of the great intellects of this ummah, when they said, Laysa muttasirin bi khalqihi wa la munfasirun anhu, he is neither connected to his creation nor separated from his creation. Laysa kamithri shayt. Allah is not the supreme being with all these uh, inferior beings. La ilaha illallah. And this is the depth of the Muslim understanding. The Muslims had the deepest and most profound understanding based on their knowledge of the Quran and on their knowledge of the Arabic language. The next is the ilm al which is knowledge of the prophets themselves. The Quran gives us knowledge of what is nubuwa. Once we identify that there is no God but Allah, that Allah is actually giving us a message, then who is the messenger? The messengers are clearly identified as men that come from the, uh, the purest of human beings and they articulate the truth for creation in different times and places. The, the, the next one is Al-Ma'ad. Where are we going? فَأَيْنَ تَذْهَبُونَ Where then are you going? This is the great Quranic question that every single individual must come to terms with. If people don't want to think about where they came from, which most people don't, and people like Stephen Jay Gold aren't really thinking about where they came from because th these people, all they look at is how. They never look at why. You see, evolution looks at how all this happened. It never looks at why. Why has this come about? Whether we believe in evolution or not is irrelevant in terms of the question itself. Why did this stuff come about? What, where did it come from? Who brought it into existence? And so knowledge of Al-Ma'ad, that we are going to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that we will be in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a way that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows, and we will be asked and taken to account for. This is the ilm al-ma'ad. The next emphasis of the Qur'an is ahkam. Once you accept your Lord, you accept that there's messengers, you accept that there's a final reckoning, how then do you live in the earth? How do you live with human beings? How do you live and worship Allah? And this is the realm of ahkam in the Qur'an. There are only 500 verses in the Qur'an that deal with ahkam, either explicitly or implicitly. It's not a great deal out of the 6,236, I believe, verses of the Qur'an. I don't know where they get 6666. I see that in books. Quit people, whoever's writing that, quit writing that. That scares the Christians. <laughs> They put their 6,666 6, verses in the Qur'an. I don't know who, I think a Christian wrote a book first of all, and then Muslims just been reading that book and getting the information, because that's not how many eyes of the Qur'an. But it scares them because it's the number of the Antichrist in their um, eschatology. So the, 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 after understanding the ahkam and applying them in our lives, Allah gives us again targhib and targhib, which is wa'ad and wa'id in the Qur'an. What we are promised if we follow the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we follow the sunnah of the messenger. وَلَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا the, you have in the messenger the best example for those who are yearning for the, the next life who desire Allah's pleasure and desire to meet Allah in the next life and do much remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so the, the wa'id is there and the wa'id which is again the tarheeb that Allah promises if we deviate from the Qur'an what will happen to us. And we are witnessing that everywhere. This is one of the beauties of the Qur'an is that it empowers the human being and allows us to know why we are where we are and how we can get out of the situation we're in. If you look all over the Muslim world, Wallahi, I, I, after deep deliberation about these things, I have come to the conclusion that all of this is in reality a rahmah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and nothing else. This is a rahmah from Allah to this ummah. Ju'ida adabu ummati fi dunyaha. The punishment of my ummah was placed in the dunya. And this is a rahmah from Allah in order that we might return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah has frightening and devastating ways of bringing His people back to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are warned about this in the Qur'an. So we should see these things. Perhaps you detest a thing, but in it is much good for you. And Allah knows. Allah knows. You do not know. We do not understand existence fully. And then the last 
uh, aspect out of these seven is the idea of qisas which is the Qur'an contains stories of those who went before us. Now the stories of those who went before us are there to teach us that we are part of an unbroken chain of struggle. The deen by its nature is mujahada, it is struggle. We are part of an unbroken chain of struggle that will continue until the end of time. It is the struggle of truth and falsehood. They they fight one another and this is the nature and that we that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give victory to those who are patient amongst us and this is why in Allah ma'asabirin what we see from those who went before us was the deep patience that they had the deep deep patience that they had in taking this message out in suffering for it wa'mir bin ma'ruf wanha an al-munkar wasbir ala ma'asabik command to good Forbid evil and be patient about what afflicts you from doing that. Tawasul bil haqi wa tawasul bil sabr. They enjoin right and they enjoin patience. By the nature of enjoining right, you will suffer afflictions. These are the seven uh, that even Juzay al Kalbi identifies in the Quran. Now, what I would like to do is just talk a little bit about the how then all of us agree that. Uh, the Quran is the way out. I don't think I've heard this so many times. What is the way out? And I've said it myself. The Quran. How is it then? Do we get from understanding this at the rational level in the intellect to literally experiencing it and living it in our lives? I believe that the Quran itself gives us the methodology for doing that. The first thing I want to say is that I, although there's a lot of work been done on the scientific miracles of the Quran, Abdul Majid Zindani. Uh, has done extraordinary work and, and really uh, people, many people have been influenced and impacted by it. I personally do not believe that the, the, I think the scientific miracles of the Quran are insignificant in relation to the purpose of the Quran because I do not believe that the purpose of the Quran is to be a book of science. There are miracles of science no doubt in the Quran, in embryology, extraordinary things, and in geog uh, geography and geology and other sciences. They are there and it's good work for people to identify those things because it's part of what they call al-ijaz al-ilmi or the incapacitating nature of the science in the Quran. But the primary ijaz of the Quran is linguistic. And what I would like to do is look at a statement uh, made by a man, Jeremy Campbell, who wrote a book about uh, information theory. He says in here, evidently nature can no longer be seen as matter and energy alone which is the 19th century view of reality, matter and energy alone. Nor can all her secrets be unlocked with the keys of chemistry and physics, which is what human beings have been attempting to do, to understand reality at the biochemical level, at the uh, atomic level, to, this is materialism at its sickest. Brilliantly successful as these two branches of science have been in our century, a third component is needed for any explanation of the world that claims to be complete. The powerful theories of chemistry and physics must be added a late arrival, a theory of information. Nature must be interpreted as matter, energy, and information. Nature must be interpreted as matter, energy, and information. That is the Quranic worldview. The Quranic worldview tells us that what we see and witness outside of ourselves are signs from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what we see and witness inside of ourselves are signs from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The witnessing itself is not simply a witnessing with the eye, which is the physical, but it's a witnessing with the heart itself, which is a super physical, a metaphysical witnessing articulated by our scholars when they say a shahada qawlun sadra an ilmin bi mushahadatin basaran wa basiratan that our witnessing that Allah there is no God but He is a articulation that manifests out of a knowledge gained by witnessing mushahada basaran with our own eyes wa basiratan and with our hearts and this is why the human being, according to the founder, I mean the Qur'an itself, but the founder of information theory, Claude Shannon, who's, who's the founder of this theory of information, says, the human being is the ideal decoder. 
This is the function of the human being, is literally to decode. And the Qur'an itself is the... It is the, the code, it is the, the translation for the human being. It is the manual by which the human being can break the code of existence. Not from a scientific aspect, and I don't doubt that there are things in there that, that deal with that, but from what, how existence works in terms of sunan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How existence works. This to me is the greatest miracle of the Qur'an, that if we learn and deeply deliberate the Qur'an. Don't they deeply deliberate and reflect on the Qur'an or are their organs of cognition, their hearts covered with locks, unable to access the book of Allah. If it was from other than Allah, they would have found much differences in it like the 50,000 errors that they found in other religious books. They would have found much differences in it, but there are not differences in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because the book of Allah is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This can only be grasped in a deep and sincere way with yaqeen and certainty by deep reflection on the book of Allah. And this is the job of Ulil al-Bab, the people containing innermost core that break away the shell of superficial thought that transcend the shell of superficial thought and enter in to the meanings that Allah has immersed the human being in both in his experience of the world and in the greatest and the divine articulation of who the creator of the world is, what the world is and what our place and all the various types of people and creation that exist in the, uh, in the in existence itself. And this is an act of discovery. To enter into this is an act of discovery which in itself is to enter into the experience of ecstasy. The word in Arabic to, to find or discover is the same root word that we use for existence itself. Wujud is existence. Wajada means to find but it also means to be ecstatic because discovery is a state of ecstasy. When they asked Abu Hanifa radiallahu anhu bima adrak al -ilm, how did you gain knowledge? He said bilhamdi wa shukr by hamd and shukr. And the meaning of that is that he said, Every time I increased in my knowledge and understanding, I thanked Allah and I gave Him uh, hamd, praise, and He increased me in my knowledge and understanding. And you thank Allah by blessings, things that make you felicitous, things that give you sa'adah. This is why we thank Allah. The Qur'an is a book of sa'adah. It is for the mu'mineen. We have revealed from this Qur'an what is a healing and a mercy for the mu'mineen. It will only increase those transgressing in loss. Why? Because they're gaining by transgression and the Qur'an stops transgression. Give victory to your brother, the oppressor and the oppressed. How do we give victory to our brother, the oppressor? By stopping him from his oppressing. And this is what the Qur'an does. It will only increase the volume in loss because it stops him from his oppression. And this is what the Muslims who adhere to the Book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have done. The way the methodology in, 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 in deriving benefit from the Qur'an is in the Qur'an itself. The first thing that the Qur'an, when it announces itself, it, that it is a wahi from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then it tells us that these are signs. Now a sign in linguistic theory is something that must be decoded. You have to decode a sign in order to arrive at a knowledge of what that sign is indicating. And, and the sign is indicating what's, it's a, it's a signifier of something beyond it. And this is, the world is both a sign of the existence and unity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but the Qur'an itself is a sign of an explanation of the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and of the Creator. And so the first thing is to recognize that the Qur'an is a book literally of ayat. Now to, in order to decode that, those signs, we must learn the language of the Qur'an. The language of the Qur'an is Arabic. The language of the Qur'an is Arabic. Imam al-Shafi'i in his Risala said, وَيَجِبُ عَلَى كُلِّ مُسْلِمٍ 
and yata'allam min al-arabiyyati ma yadruguhu juhduhu. It's obligatory on every Muslim that he learns from the Arabic language what his capacity enables him to do. And this was the position of the early community. And I'm not, I'm not an Arab here like giving some kind of, no, I, this is a language that I learned myself and I'm still learning because it's a vast language. But the point is that Muslim and, and really to me, the English language is, is, is a language, it's a human language, it's a sign of Allah. Allah says in your tongues and in your colors are signs. It's a sign of Allah, but it's for the Muslims to me, it is a sign of our humiliation and our subjugation. That we speak, that English has become the language of our conferences and our intellectual and scholastic pursuits is an indication of our humiliation because it's a language of a people that conquered many Muslim lands. And they have implant, they've given us this language and this is what we're left with. It's a language that, and I say this as a native speaker of the language, it is a poor language. It's a poor language. It's what the Arab, they call it, uh, the language of commerce. Which doesn't mean they don't have philosophy and Shakespeare, Sheikh Zubair, right? They even say he was an Arab. But the, 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 the point that as long as we're trapped in the language of English, I believe as an intellectual community, we will not rise to the level anywhere near what those who went before us do. Part of, of regaining our heritage is regaining the Arabic language. And also, unlike almost all the other languages in existence, the complexification of languages increases despite the fact that, that, that it, it, it changes. In other words, Latin moved into Italian, Spanish, French. These are like slangs or dialects of Latin. But by the nature of language, because they left Latin, there was a complexification that took place that enabled them to articulate difficult thought. Unfortunately, this has not occurred in the Arabic language. And the reason for that, I say unfortunately, I really not unfortunately, but it has unfortunate consequences. The Arabic language by its nature has been preserved intact, unchangeable with the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Arab grammarians and the Arab uh, lexicographers were the first people, the first dictionary in the English language is 16th century. They don't even know really what Chaucer's uh, language meant. They can only guess at a lot of words, the meanings of words. The Hebrew language, the Hebrews caught on to dictionaries from the Muslims. And this is why in modern biblical studies in Tel Aviv and the universities where they study, they go to Arabic roots to understand the Bible. This is a fact that I'm not making this up. They go to Arabic roots to understand the Bible because they recognize that as a Semitic language, it is the only language that has maintained a lexical purity that other languages have not uh, maintained because of the preservation of our scholars. And, and by the tawfiq of Allah, because when Allah said, inna nahnu nazalna dhikr wa inna dahu lahafidhun, that includes the preservation of the Arabic language because it's an essential aspect. The Arabic language has been preserved and it's there for whoever wants it. If you want dunya, then learn English. But if you want akhirah, learn Arabic. Because it is the language that literally opens up a whole world of meaning that is inaccessible in the English language and I'm saying that as somebody who is bilingual, who, who reads the Quran in Arabic and reads English. The, the Arabic, the, the Quran is not the Quran in English. It cannot be called the Quran in English. And this is not a kind of, you know, a boasting of, of the scholars of the past. No, part of the i'jaz of the Quran is the Arabic language itself and it is a language of revelation. So we must learn the language of the book itself. And this includes Arabs who go through year 12 years of high school and they can't, they, they can't, uh, you know, one, one of the ulama, I think it was Muhammad ibn Hussein said this, khassat, khassat hadi al-umma bi thalath, al-ansab, wal-isnad, wal-i'rab. This ummah has been given three uh, special things. Uh, knowledge of the ansab, genealogy, the knowledge of the Isnad, Lawla Sanad Laqala Man Sha Ma Sha'a, as Ibn al Mubarak said, if it wasn't for the Senate of this Ummah, then he would have said whatever he wanted to say, whoever wanted to say it. So we have the Senate, which is the unbroken chain of transmission, which the Quran exists to this day in an unbroken chain of transmission to the Messenger of Allah, to Jibreel, alayhi salam, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are Muslims who memorize the Quran with a Senate, unbroken chain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
and this exists to our day. It's a miracle of the Qur'an that we have an absolute senate of unbroken chain of transmitters of the Qur'an. Both Mushafahatan and Mushafahatan wa Kitabatan by articulation and by writing. It's unbroken. Rasm al-Uthmani, all of this has been preserved. So learning the Arabic language. Now the, the next aspect is, and this does not mean if you don't know Arabic, you can't read the meanings of the Qur'an. I'm not suggesting that, but I'm saying it's a crutch. And lame people use crutches. But the beauty of it is you can throw away your crutches because the Arabic language is learnable. I mean, Maurice Bukail was 50 years old when he learned the Arabic language. A French scientist who just wanted to read the Qur'an in its original language. 52 years old. We have Muslims that speak English better than the Queen. They speak English better than the Queen. Why? Why is that? People grow up in the Swat Valley and they speak Queen's English. Well, we want to speak the King's language, not the... So, Allah says in the Qur'an, وَإِذَا قُرِيَ الْقُرْآنِ فَاسْتَمِعُوا لَهُ وَأَنْصِتُوا لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ If we want rahmah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is, Allah has given us the formula. When the Qur'an is recited, listen to it. Now the word in Arabic here, istama'u, is from an eight form verb, is istama'a, which is what is, it's called bab al mutawah which means it's a reflexive. It goes back into the self. In other words, it's not simply a hearing. It is an internalization of the, the hearing. It's a hearkening. If we say in the first form, sami'a, Now, but that's not what istama' means. That is what sami'a means. Istama' means to internalize it. So you, you not only hear the word, you internalize it. You take it into the self. You allow it to go through the ear and into the heart where it's understood and comprehended. Wa'ansitu. And then once it enters into the heart, there has to be silence and stillness. There has to be silence and stillness. If you do not still the heart from the chatter of the world, then you cannot understand and penetrate the meanings of the Book of Allah. لا يمسه إلا المطهرون. They only touch it, the purified ones, the purified ones. مطهرون, which is a passive form. They are purified by their ikhlas to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Allah purifies them. They only have access, intimate access to it. Those who are purified. And so this Quran has to be internalized. There has to be istim, this this istima'a. فاستمعوا له وأنصتوا لعلكم ترحمون in order that you are shown rahma. Now, we, one of the uh, things that I think is, is a sign of the, the sickness of our ummah is that we no longer listen to the Qur'an. In other words, in our souks, the Qur'an now is played like background music. You will hear it, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem. You will hear Qur'an now in the souks of all the Muslim countries. You will hear the Qur'an even in the souk. And if you hear it here, then tell the people to stop playing it. Because the souq is not the place for Qur'an, in fact it's makru to uh, recite the Qur'an in the souq. Except for Talib Ilm who's doing muraja'ah, and you can look at the books of fiqh, I'm not making that up. And I was once trying to do a transaction and somebody had a CD of Qur'an that he was trying to sell, and I asked him, please turn it off, and he said, why? And I said, because Allah says, إِذَا قُرِيَ Quran فَاسْتَمِعُوا لَهُ If you hear the Qur'an, listen to it and be silent. And, and I can't make a business transaction if you've got Qur'an playing. And he said, is it wajib? See, this is, I mean, this is a sickness. This is a sickness. It means there's a deep loss of adab. And this is what's happened in our ummah. We have lost adab to the Book of Allah. I, I'm going to, I'll close it up now. We've lost adab to the Book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, from the adab of the Book of Allah is that you listen to it when it's recited. And you're silent. Now, in the Quran, it says, لا ترفع أصواتكم فوق صوت النبي. Don't raise your voices over the voice of the Prophet. The ulama, many of them said it includes when hadith is being recited. Now there's a principle in tafsir, mafhum al-awla, which is the, the even more strong, like when Allah says, don't say to your parents, uff, 
that's the least thing you can do. It obviously means not hitting them or going down. If we're commanded to be silent when the Prophet ﷺ is speaking, then what is the commandment when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself is speaking, which is the kalam of Allah, which is the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we hear the book of Allah, we should go silent. If you don't understand it, then be silent anyway. لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ In order that you'll be shown rahmah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The, the Qur'an is the unending miracle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is the book that enriches those who have no wealth. It dignifies those who are based and, 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 and subjugated. It gives nourishment to those who are spiritually malnourished. It is a book that brings light and life to the dead and the blind. Summun bukmun umyun fahum la yubsirun. Allah says about them, they are blind, deaf and dumb and they do not see. They're, they are deaf, they can't hear, and they can't speak, they can't articulate, and they can't see. And the Muslim is somebody who is listening attentively to the signs of Allah, seeing the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because the signs are both things that we see with the eyes, a sam'a wal basar wal fu'ad. We see with the eyes, we hear with the ears, and we understand in our hearts. The Muslims are people of intellect, they're not people of uh, stupidity and, and idiocy. Muslims are people of intellect and the Quran is a book that demands deep thought. It is not a book for simplistic, uh, for just, just a, a, a book that, no, it, it absolutely demands from us that we think. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, بَلْ نَقْفِفَ الْحَقِّ عَلَى الْبَاطِلِ فَيَدْمَغُهُ فَإِذَا هُوَ زَاهِقٌ We thrust this Quran against falsehood and all forms of truth against falsehood and it is overcome. Now the Arab, there's a modern translation that says, and it smashes out their brains. Which, that's a gross mistranslation of Quran. Because damaga, although in its, one of the meanings is yusabat to dimah to hit, strike the brain. That striking does not mean smashing it physically out, which is a lot of, a way that a lot of Muslim, modern Muslims would like to uh, finish arguments by smashing out their opponent's brains. No, we are people of Burhan, and the proof is, if you read the ayahs that follow that verse, you will see that they all asking about, uh, do you think there's more than one God in creation? Haven't you looked at the heavens and the earth? It's using intellectual proofs to show these people. In other words, yadmughu means that it overwhelms their intellect until they have to admit that it is the truth from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Muslims have never been afraid of open debate and open discourse. The Muslims have never been afraid of open debate and open discourse. Abu Hanifa radiallahu anhu, he debated the atheists in the masjids. He debated people that didn't believe in the ba'ath. This is what the Muslims, because they were not afraid of any forms of falsehood because they have the truth. But because we're so distant from the book of Allah, we actually fear now all of this falsehood that is out there. Wallahi idha ja al haq zahaq al batal inna al batal kana zahuqa. If the truth comes, falsehood vanishes, falsehood is vanishing. The Prophet, when Sayyidina Ali, he said, Fitanun ka qat al-layla mudrim There are afflictions like a dark black night. And then Ali, karamallahu wajah, radiallahu anhu said, Ma al-khalasu yawma idhin ya Rasulullah. What is the way out on that day? He said, Kitab Allah, the Book of Allah. Fihi naba'u ma qabrukum, wa khabru ma ba'dukum, wa hukmu ma baynukum. It has the... Uh, information of those who went before, news about those who will come after, and it is a judgment between you. The Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ دَعَ إِلَيْهِ هُدِيَ إِلَى سَرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ أَقُلُوا قَوْرِ هَذَا وَاسْتَغْفِرَ اللَّهِ لِي وَلَكُمُ لِسَائِرَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَيْكُمْ وَرَحْمُ اللَّهِ Takbir 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 Jazakallah, Brother Hamza. Uh, in view of the shortage of time, I'm going to allow only one question if anyone in the audience has a burning question to ask Brother Hamza. I invite just one question. Yes, Brother. If you would stand up and... Is there a microphone in the...
the question, if I understood it right, was as from Arabic speaking people, because an Arab by definition is somebody who speaks Arabic. And the word in fact comes from a word which means to articulate clearly. Araba, Ya'ribu, means to articulate clearly. And some call Al Arab Ain uh, is, is like Rabb Al Ain, things like that. But the, and some say it comes from Ya'rub, which is one of the fathers of Arabic. But it, it's those who articulate clearly, which means the vast majority of people now claiming to be Arab are not really Arab. In fact, if the Sahaba heard them, I think they would just shake their heads and say, Are these, what, what kind of language is this? Huh? <laughs> They would just say, what, what, what was that? Ektub bi elami. That means in Arabic, I write with pain. <laughs> so they, you know, they really wouldn't understand, I don't think. I mean, they heard Suhaib Rumi once saying, Ya Nas, Ya Nas. And Umar ibn al-Khattab said, Ma bada Suhaib, yunadi al-Nas. What's wrong with Suhaib? He's calling the people. And he said, no, no, he has a boy named Yahnas. But Suhaib had ujma in his tongue. So he didn't pronounce the ha very strongly. Um, I would say that the, the, the way that we go back to the Qur'an is taking the minhaj of the Salaf people. The minhaj of the Salaf was to read the Qur'an in 30 days. This was the minhaj of the Salaf. The Qur'an was divided into 30 juz, 60 hiz, 30 juz. The, the, the hiz was 60 to be recited at Fajr and Maghrib. It takes about 15 to 20 minutes to read. And most people spend more time in the bathroom um, doing their toiletries than, than that takes, really. I mean, just to put our priorities straight. Um, Abu Hanifa anhu, who is oftentimes the most generous in terms of his uh, leniency, um, said that the, the least amount that we can recite the Quran is twice a year. That it must be recited at least twice a year. The Prophet وسلم, in a there's a hadith that has weakness that Ar Razi uh, mentions that uh, says Man arba'ina faqad jafa. The one that has gone past 40 days and hasn't completed the Quran has been rude to the Quran. The Quran must be read, but it has to be read with deliberation. We know that the Sahaba did not memorize the Quran until they were acting according to it, and this will increase us in our knowledge. Man amila bima alima awrathahu ilma ma'alam ya'lam. Whoever acts according to what he knows, Allah will increase him in his knowledge. So there's increase by acting according to what we know. The the Arabic language, the Quranic Arabic, although there are deep intricacies and subtleties in the Quranic Arabic, by and large, the Quranic Arabic is not a complicated Arabic. It is mubin. The hadiths are actually more difficult to read than much of the Quran. But the Qur'an must be read with commentary. And the commentary is, uh, is something that, this is one of the problems of the modern age, is that people are literally reading the Qur'an, misunderstanding, there's people reading English translations and misunderstanding because the translator misunderstood it. And there's misunderstandings in the translations. And also translations only give one aspect. The Qur'an oftentimes have many different aspects. So the, the Quranic Arabic, there's a, a beautiful uh, vocabulary that is not extensive, that can be learned very quickly. I have a class that has been working um, with me two hours a week for about three and a half, uh, almost four years. To, and they are, they, all of them were ajam when they came in, and now they're reading the Quran with a considerable amount of understanding. They can understand it with a dictionary using, relying on a dictionary for some words. And this shows you just that a small amount of time, a massive amount can be gained. Now, Arabs already have a considerable um, jump on everybody else because there's a great deal of the Quranic uh, Arabic that they still can understand even for a person on the street. My friend uh, Abdullah Omar in Jeddah told me he was in Egypt once and he, he speaks Fusha Arabic and he got in a taxi and he said, uh, and the man said, Sada Allah al Azim. So, now, Egyptian taxi drivers are notorious for being like what they call Khafif al Dam. So, I don't know if he was just not understanding it was Quran or he was making fun of my friend. Um, but we'll give him the benefit of the doubt. 
let not one people mock another people, perhaps they're better than them. So um, the, the most beautiful tafsir that we have um, is the Jalalain for a quick understanding of the Qur'an. It's in a remarkable work with, and I also recommend a Tasheel al-Ulum al-Tanzil by Ibn Juzay al-Kalbi, which is also uh, concise and just brilliant in, in, in what it contains. And then you move on to the bigger tafsirs. But we should identify resources. And the other thing I didn't, I wanted to talk about this, but again, I'm just not, uh, I need to be, be more uh, structured. But um, I wanted to talk about our children. And, and giving our children the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet ﷺ said on the Yawm Qiyamah that the parents who give the Qur'an to their children will be given crowns that radiate like suns. Yutawwiju, tijan, talma'u kashams. I mean, subhanAllah. Uh, I don't understand how we can give our children chemistry and biology and physics and... I mean, it's just, the, they're not going to be tested about that stuff on Yawm Qiyamah, which is not to under, you know, to, to diminish the importance of, of those sciences. I'm not, but we need to get our priorities right. And our priority above and beyond everything should be the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And wallahi, and I'm saying this and making an oath by Allah, our ulama who were the gr most brilliant scientists and scholars that, that the world has ever known, I mean way beyond the people now who don't even know how to, to take care of themselves. I mean, scientists are uninspiring individuals, uh, by and large. And it's not all of them, but a lot of them. They look at these Western scientists. They don't even know the, how to send it to me on email. They don't even want to talk to people anymore. Send it to me on email. Um, but these are ulama, all of them, what they share in common is that they memorize the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they learn the language of the Arabs. And I believe personally that that ayah in the Quran is absolutely uh, literal in its meaning in order that you use your intellects that you learn to use your intellects when Allah tells us the reason why we're all scattered and separated he says uh, because there are people that don't use their intellects you think that they're united their hearts are separate because they don't use their intellects we need to begin using our intellects raise up to the level of this deen and Arabic is a means, it's a tool. That's all it is. It's a tool, but it's a powerful tool that empowers the intellect to certain types of, of understandings that are not available to people through other uh, linguistic mediums. Jazakumullah khairan wa